So essentially what banks do is that they create money by giving out loans. Now, as a result of you getting a loan or a company getting a loan, what they will do with that loan is that that loan will get into their bank account. And as a result of it getting into that bank account, which would be a business bank account in this case, that business bank account will then pay people, whether that be staff or whether that is suppliers. And as a result of those payments, these guys also have banks and that money will then go into those banks as well. So if this specific bank loan was say one million rand and that went into the firm's account, basically bits and pieces, let's say this staff got 200,000 and the suppliers got say 100,000. That essentially means that there's 200,000 more money in the country when it comes to staff and 300,000 more money when it comes to suppliers. So essentially, all in all, 300,000 is the amount which the money stock has increased by. Let me know in the chat if that makes any sense. Well, give me a thumbs up if you got that. Awesome. Now here's the problem with this. The banks theoretically can do this with an unlimited amount of tries. But now the problem is that that 300,000 that we spoke about initially, right? The problem with that 300,000 is that if we consistently get an influx of money in the sense of money stock into the economy then this ultimately produces inflation because there's more money than goods on the other hand if there's no creation of money whatsoever, then what will end up happening is that there'll be stagnation. And stagnation means that basically the economy will obviously start dwindling or the economy as a whole will start you know deteriorating and we also don't want that so the company that not the company sorry the institution that obviously then handles this is now what we call this south african reserve bank and how they handle this is through an instrument called the monetary policy And this monetary policy, all it does is that it manipulates the interest rate.
So it'll make sure that one, the inflation is obviously mitigated or controlled. On the other hand, it will also make sure by all means that there's no stagnation in the country as well by using the monetary policy. So let's get to understand what the monetary policy is. But first and foremost, before we do that, um, let's do some quick highlighting. We're on page 294. Uh, last I remember. And there's a bold bit that says there is no independent money supply curve. Let's highlight that. Before we discuss monetary policy further, you should take you should take note that there is no independent monetary supply curve. What happens is that the stock of money is determined by the interaction of the demand for money and the interest rate where the latter is determined mainly in the central bank next sentence that i'd want you guys to highlight or paragraph i should rather say would be the following right after that the money demand curve ll is the same as the one explained in section 14.6 and we discussed this the whole of last week uh being what was it? it was actually this week apologies uh being the following two graphs graph number one graph number two this was l1 this was l2 Right, and this was graph A, this was graph B, and graph C basically was a combination of graph one plus graph two. So we find now on page 294, figure 14.2. And figure 14.2 is basically the same graph is exactly the same graph as 14.2. So 14.1c is exactly the same graph as 14.2. Nothing's changed. The only difference now is that they obviously have um, a few things on our y axis and on our x axis as well. So, as we read this out, I just want to keep that in mind. I want you to keep that in mind. We're still on the third, fourth paragraph from the top on page 14. And it says the money demand curve LL is the same as explained in section 14.6. The interest rate is determined or largely influenced by the central bank through its accommodation policy. The quantity of money is determined by the interest, the interaction of interest rate and the demand for money. At an interest rate of I0, the quantity of money will be M0. A reduction in the interest rate to I1 initiated by a lowering of the repo rate will raise the quantity of money M1, Citrus Paribus. There is thus no independent money supply curve. Instead, the quantity of money depends on the demand for money and the cost of credit. This is called the demand determined money stock or indigenous money. Up to now, we've assumed that the monetary authorities are in a position to change the interest rate, but we have not examined how this is done in practice. In South Africa, changes in the market interest rates through change in the repo rate are the key element of monetary policy. Monetary policy is the domain of monetary authorities in the country, and the central bank is usually the most important monetary authority institution. 
Right. Let's let's talk quickly about this graph that's in front of us, figure 14.2. Then I've got some quick and some cool questions to ask you guys as well, uh, just around your thought process in this regard. Just going to draw it out, and wherever you are, I would also advise that you do exactly the same thing. Right. So we've got the monetary policy. And one of the instruments in the monetary policy is what we call the repo rate. And that repo rate is basically controlled by the South African Reserve Bank. And the instrument around that would be, that is used in that case is what we call the interest rate. So what will happen is that where I is initially, there's a certain amount of money let me go all the way. There's a certain amount of money at that point in time being M0. Now, if we realize, for instance, that in this case, the interest rate or the rather the money supply that's that is in the economy right now, or the money that's being demanded, I should rather say, because there is no money supply. So the money that's currently being demanded is causing inflation. It essentially means that we need to have less money being demanded. Now, based on what we know about the South African Reserve Bank and the repo rate, tell me, how would they reduce the money being demanded? Would they increase the interest rate? or would they decrease the interest rate? Let me know in the chat. Ria says that they increase, Amber also agrees. Okay, 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 okay. We've got three agreements, so I'm gonna go straight ahead and say 100% guys, you guys are correct. Alessa, you're also on the money. Jared, you're also on the money as well. They would increase it. Now, what's important here, guys, is that if you've got the graph in front of you and you're drawing this as well, you then put the new interest rate here because there's been an increase to basically circumvent inflation. I'll then draw a horizontal line to the liquidity preference curve. And once I have touched the liquidity preference curve at that specific coordinate, I'll then begin to draw a vertical line to the X axis. And then I'll call this M1. And from here, I'll just make sure that I show a couple of arrows to show what has happened. The first arrow would be here showing that there's been an increase in the interest rate. And then the next arrow would be here, showing that there's been a decrease in the money demanded or the quantity of money in circulation. The last arrow, I'd put an E0 here, and then an E1 over here, and then just show that there has been a movement along the curve and in this case, an upward movement along the curve. Are there any questions in this concern? Do we understand? If you do understand, just give me a thumbs up in the chat. And if we have three, then we're good to go. And we can just do some theory. Okay, perfect. Perfect, 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 perfect. All right, and vice versa is also true, guys. If there is... If the economy needs to be stimulated, all they'll do is that they'll basically take the repo rate and say, we're going to 
decrease the interest rate and as a result you will then have a better economy running that's to do with interest rates and uh, the quantity of money we've now exhausted that uh, topic so we can move straight into the role of the south african reserve bank in the economy just let me know in the chat have you guys seen the south african reserve bank or better yet do you know where the south african reserve bank is Yes, yes, yes. It doesn't necessarily supply money to the country. What it does is that it basically regulates uh, money in the country. Um, and Jesse, last I checked, the South African Reserve Bank should be in Pretoria. Um, only been there once in my life, though. But the JSC, however, is in Johannesburg. Not really, but I do uh, remember that I used to pass. Yes, in this case, the mint is uh, the mint is elsewhere. But the South African Reserve Bank, the actual building that should be in uh, CBD Pretoria, last I checked, had the privilege of being there when I was in Pretoria, um, Varsity College Pretoria at that point in time. Did my undergraduate degree in economics, and uh, we were able to go and see Joe Marcus, who was then the acting governor um so that was that was a that was a cool time a really cool time so chapter 14.7 goes into the role of the south african reserve bank in the economy and what i want you guys to do is basically do some highlighting around this the first is the last sentence before the two points it says awesome Awesome, Jesse. Awesome. The last sentence uh, before those two points is the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa clearly states that the primary objective of the South African Reserve Bank is to protect the value of the currency in the interest balance and sustainable economic growth of the Republic. Very important. When we look at our currency, we want to be strong enough to make sure that we can buy international purchases, but at the same time, we want it to be weak enough for people to buy things from us as well. It's a very interesting dynamic in that regard, so it's really touch and go most of the time. The second bit then says, the South African Reserve Bank, in pursuit of its primary objective, must perform its functions independently and without fear, favor, or prejudice. But they must be clear or regular consultation between the bank and the cabinet member responsible for the national financial matters. This is a very important point. Uh, Christopher, yes, yes, Christopher, very delicate uh, balance. And uh, thanks for the reminder about the mint. I, I knew that I'd, I'd seen it once. I just didn't know where exactly. Guys, the South African Reserve Bank acts what, in what we call um, in an autonomous behavior. And by that, we mean that they've got their own framework in how they deal with matters around currency and matters around inflation and so forth. Do they act autonomous in the sense that they don't care about what's happening in the economy? No. They'll already sit down with the financial minister. They'll sit down with other cabinet members as well. They'll sit down with the bank heads, and then they'll make a decision as a result. But they act independent of that. And what this allows, guys, at the end of the day is that they are not part and parcel of any um, political ideologies and the like. Right. And every country that has a South African Reserve Bank um, or not South African Reserve Bank, but has their own reserve bank or something that works exactly like that, they all need to be independent for the exact same reason. Because if a political party says that we want to reduce the amount of loans 
um, the, the interest rate of the amount of loans. Sorry, if we want to produce, we want to ensure that at the end of the day, we have more money in circulation and we want to reduce the interest rate of loans, right? This is a political party that does this. Now, a political party will do that for one reason. They basically want to get favor of the people. And if the South African Reserve Bank is in cahoots with any one of these political parties and they decide to agree with them and they reduce the interest rate, while people will be happy for maybe the first year or two, later on they'll obviously be frustrated because now they're in a position where the economy has more money than goods and therefore lots of inflation begins to ensue. This was something that happened in uh, Zimbabwe where they had a huge amount of inflation, right? So this is why these guys are always separate from everybody else. Do they consult with different cabinet members and the Minister of Finance? Yes, but they are separate from everybody else. And this is very important because we don't want our currencies and our financial well-being to be uh, tampered with uh, by political ideologies. We prefer that to the political, the political um, ideologies to be far away, obviously, from um, that of the South African Reserve Bank. Uh, a couple of years ago, however, um, and I can say this because obviously Julius had put it across, Julius wanted to make sure that the South African Reserve Bank did not act in a place of independence. And that, like I said, brings about its own problems. Um, we don't want that to be happening anytime soon. And when I say we, I'm probably talking about myself. Um, when you guys obviously do your own homework, you'll be able to also have and articulate um, your own position in that regard as well. So just those two points and their relevance in the country currently. Empty promises. Uh, and unfortunately, that is the case with, uh, with, with politics. Politics at the end of the day, and we're going to deal with that in the next section um, or the next uh, chapter, you realize that what a politician is meant to do is basically get votes. That's it. Whether they fulfill on the promises that they gave to get those votes is another story in and of itself. And this is not a, a, an ANC thing. It's not a DA thing. It is a politician thing. Wherever you go in any country, politicians basically want to get the votes of the people and they'll say what the people need to hear in order to do that. Uh, when it comes down to implementation, you realize that there's a huge um, disparity between the two because then the politician realizes that, hey, man, what I was promising doesn't really make sense. But whether we actually hear about that is another story in and of itself. Uh, we usually just hear that, you know, this person either resigned or this person um, is messing around and so on and so forth. It's, 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 it's quite a mess. Politics is quite a mess. Um, yeah, and I'll just uh, end that thought there. So... So in this case, what I want you to highlight next, guys, is on page 294, it says the Reserve Bank is the main monetary authority in South Africa, and its current functions can be grouped into the following four major areas of responsibility. Guys, this is key stuff. One, the formulation and implementation of monetary policy, so service to the government. So these guys will form and implement monetary policy, service to the government, right? provision of economic and statistical services. So you'll find that when it comes down to um, certain statistics, the best place to obviously go to around economics and so forth, economic statistics will obviously be that of your reserve bank. And then maintaining financial stability. This is the most important one, um, I would personally say. Let's go with the first one, formulation and implementation of monetary policy. We're on page 295. It says there, the South African Reserve Bank is responsible for formulating and implementing monetary policy. The way in which the bank's other functions are fulfilled is determined mainly by the goals of the monetary policy at that juncture. The bank's accommodation policy, also referred to as the bank's refinancing system, or more commonly, the repo rate tender system, is mainly the, is the main instrument through which monetary policy is conducted in South Africa. Through its refinancing system, the bank meets the daily liquidity of private banks. In order to ensure that the refinancing system's influence on interest rates in general remains effective, the bank has to compel the banks to borrow a substantial amount, um, which is now the liquidity requirement from the South African Reserve Bank. But other instruments like open market operations are used to drain excess liquidity from the money market in order to ensure a liquidity shortage at all time, times. 
South Africa's monetary policy framework is discussed more in detail in 14.8. And we'll get into that soon enough. So what these guys do, what the repo rate is, is the amount of or the percentage that the, re the South African Reserve Bank is willing to lend money to the uh, main banks. So basically, and I'm going to draw it out as well, you'll find the South African Reserve Bank will begin to loan out money to the different banks. And uh, that would be, in this case, say, uh, FNB. Nedbank. Standard Bank. And ABSA. I know somebody who's probably going, no, you forgot, sir, you forgot. Uh, let's put Capitec in there as well. And uh, perhaps we could also add Discovery. So the South African Reserve Bank basically loans all of these banks money, every single one of them. Now, the percentage that these banks will then pay back to the South African Reserve Bank is now what we call the repo rate. So here's a question that I have for you guys. If South African Reserve Banks, the South African Reserve Bank, I mean to say, increases the repo rate tell me when it comes down to the civilians that decide to ask for loans hundred percent i'd absolutely say that jesse absolutely when the interest rate then is then increased right the south african reserve bank when it increases its um interest rate which is the cost it the cost it takes for obviously banks to you know basically have money from them or loan money from them guess who is the person that pays for that interest at the end of the day do you think it's the bank or do you think it's actually people yes we do Absolutely. But judging by what we had discussed in the prior section, we also realized that as yo, I think I've, I'm not spelling people right, am I? Oh, well, you guys get the point. We <laughs> can just spell people for the sake of it. Something tells me I'm, I'm spelling people wrong. Um, I don't know if there's an A in there that I'm missing or not. Um, yeah. Oh, there's actually an O. Anyhow, guys. Um, <laughs> I don't know what... Okay, cool. Thanks, man. Maybe it's just been a long day. Maybe it's just been a long day. Okay, people. And people. So we eventually begin to start paying, obviously, the, 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 the effects of that repo rate, right? So like I said before, in the former sections, when that happens, right, the repo rate is then increased. Tell me, are we interested in getting as many loans as we would have had the interest rate remained the same? Or do we say, that's OK, we're going to get more loans. What happens to our interest when it comes to loans? Does it decrease or increase?
decreases, reassess. Is everybody in agreement with that? Anybody else, guys? Or should I ask the question again? Okay. So I was asking that if the South African Reserve Bank increases its repo rate, which is the interest that other banks, commercial banks would pay for borrowing money from the South African Reserve Bank, if that increases, we agree that the people obviously will be at the brunt of it. They will have to obviously then pay that additional interest rate. Now, the question I was asking was that so when, as people realize this, and we hear that the interest rate is increasing um, because of the South African Reserve Bank, as people, we then increase the amount of loans that we want to get, or we, or we decrease the amount of loans that we want to get as a result of the repo rate increasing. So Ria has said, definitely decrease. Cesar agrees. Jared says decrease as well. And you guys would be 100% on the money. Okay. In this case, guys, you're 100% right. You would find that uh, when the repo rate is increased, it means, and this is now for Kieran, that at the end of the day, the South African Reserve Bank is charging other banks a higher percentage for them to borrow money from the South African Reserve Bank. But what essentially then happens is that these banks, being the commercial banks, who give out loans to civilians, will then also increase their interest rate to accommodate the change in the increase of the repo rate. So we as the people will basically pay more for our loans because the repo rate has increased and therefore will decrease the amount of loans that we ask for because we do not want to pay a whole lot more for the loans that we get. Now here's the other thing. Say for instance, for some strange reason, and they did this recently, the South African Reserve Bank decide we are going to re reduce the repo rate. What do you think will happen as a result with people? Will they increase the amount of loans that they have? Or will they decrease the amount of loans that they have? Fizzo says increase. Everybody else, what's your take? Ria agrees. Natasha, Palessa, Vaughn, uh, Jesse, Kamo, Lutabo, Amber, Monica, what's your take? Increase, yes. 
Yes, Kieran, as if as in if the South African Reserve Bank um, decreased the repo rate. Guys, you're all on the money. What will happen with the people? <laughs> I'm glad you agree, Kieran. Um, what will end up happening with, with the people is that obviously we'll begin to take out more loans and we'll want to obviously spend a whole lot more as well. So with this uh, pandemic that we've all basically, um, hmm, I'm trying to find the words, but uh, during this, this time, right, during the pandemic, what would happen with business owners and stuff like that is that they'll end up keeping money. They weren't necessarily spending. And even when it comes down to your normal civilians, we were not necessarily spending. And the reason for that was because we're in a place where we're like, mm, guys, things are tough. We don't know what happens in the future. We are not going to be spending all this money because at the end of the day, what we want to do is make sure that we can provide for ourselves. So what the South African Reserve Bank does is they say, guys, you will not believe it. The interest rate is going to drop. Uh, and the whole obviously the repo rate, we're going to be dropping the repo rate. And as a result, people went, hmm, if they're going to be dropping the repo rate, chances are they're feeling positive about the economy. And it means that basically loans are much easier to get to, number one, and less obviously to pay. So let's go and get that money. And then we'll obviously begin to um, take it from there. And that's really how the government or in this case, the South African Reserve Bank will then say, this is how we're going to stimulate the economy going forward. The economy only gets stimulated if people are obviously using their money. When people are not using their money, we're obviously in for a very tough time. Understood? Perfect. The next bit that we have there on page 295 still is the following. It says they service to the government, right? And how do they serve the government? It says they bank, banker and advisor, right? And I want you guys to read the, I believe it's the second, third sentence. It says bank is still the main banker of, sorry, the reserve bank is still the main banker of the government. It grants credit deals with weekly issues of treasury bills on behalf of the treasury, advises the government with regards to monetary and financial matters, and is responsible for the administration of all exchange control regulations, which is now obviously foreign currencies and the like. Secondly, it says they're custodian of gold and foreign exchange reserves, right? So there's a relation between them and um, the mint. With exception of necessary balances held by banks and the treasury, the Reserve Bank keeps all countries' gold and foreign exchange reserves. Gold coins and gold bullion are added to the reserves at the market-related price. The level of South Africa's gold and other foreign reserves is one of the main barometers of the state of the economy and of prospects for future economic growth. At the end of the day, I, and this is now my perception, when it comes down to wealth, um, putting your money into precious metals is usually a good way to go because gold is going to be something that people are still going to find value in um, years from now. Provided, of course, they don't necessarily find a, um, a lot more gold going forward and becomes too abundant. Um, right now, seeing that it's still scarce, it's a very good place to put your money into. There was a, a gentleman that I was dealing with um, in another class, and he said that there was a gold coin that somebody had that was manufactured in the States like eons ago. And basically that coin right now is worth uh, 15,000 US dollars, right? Which is the equivalent of I think about 200 and something thousand Rand. Um, and this coin is, is, is no bigger than your five Rand coin. Um, it's, it's like, you know, that kind of size. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. I mean, that's, you're walking around with basically 200,000 in your pocket, but I know you obviously don't keep the coin. Um, the coin is obviously kept in a safe, but that's the, the value of, of precious metals. So we are saying here that what the Reserve Bank does is that they actually keep um, gold coins and they keep gold bullion as well. Moving right along. It says that in this regard, the bank is also responsible for the formulation of the exchange rate policy. All right. Next bit. Administration of exchange control. The Reserve Bank is responsible for exchange control in South Africa. 
Exchange control restricts the movement of foreign exchange in order to protect an economy from disruptive fluctuations in capital movements and other international economic shocks. We're on page 295 here. and we are on the third bullet point under or the third bullet point on the left um, under service to the government so what happens on a regular basis is that uh, South Africa will have a certain amount of United States dollars um, and they'll also have, you know, other currencies as well. What they try to do is they try to make sure that they minimize the fluctuation of that money leaving and coming in, leaving and coming in. They want to be in a place where obviously they have enough U.S. dollars to obviously do, you know, purchases and so forth. But at the same time, they don't have too much U.S. dollars because what that does is that it strengthens the rand. And as a result, when it comes to exports, other countries might say your rand is too strong. We don't have the finances to obviously purchase what it is that you guys are selling or want to provide. So they try to make sure they mitigate that consistently. On page 295, it has the provision of economic and statistical services. And I want you to highlight the paragraph that follows underneath. The bank collects, processes, interprets, and publishes economic statistics and other information. The data these publications contain are major source of information for policymakers, analysts, and researchers. Now, policymakers in this case, guys, would obviously be people in the bank, which, uh, or rather in the government, which obviously sits down to your um, government officials and the like. So this is one way that the South African Reserve Bank is obviously being of assistance. Analysts and researchers, there are places out there that uh, are particular boutique firms, right? And what these boutique firms do is that they sit down and they make sure that at the end of the day, they're able to draw out information um, from the research that the South African Reserve Bank does. And what they do with this information is that they sell it to firms that may need it. One of those firms that I know of that does something like this, maybe I can't mention their name, so I'll keep that. Uh, but basically they'll put papers together papers that obviously show what's going on in the country and so forth, get expert opinions on them. And let's say if Apple comes into the country and says, guys, we want to build X amount of shops in X amount of places, they might go to a boutique firm, um, consulting firm, and they'll sit down with them and say, what do you guys say about this? And they'll obviously then give them the papers, give Apple the papers, and Apple will obviously make a decision based on that. So it's, the South African Reserve Bank is pretty important in that regard. Pretty, pretty important. Guys, let's take that 10 minute break. And when we come back, we're going to finish chapter 14 and um, do dips and drives of chapter 15. I'll see you guys right at 2 o'clock after the 10 minute break.
right guys let's uh begin and uh here we have our page number and we're reading from Maintaining financial stability. Right. So, first things first, and this is going to be quite a bit of highlighting with uh, some discussion here and there. It says that the South African Reserve Bank regards financial stability as its most important objective. Please highlight that. In pursuit of this objective, the bank plays a pivotal role in the following areas. One, bank supervision. The Reserve Bank is responsible for bank regulation and supervision in South Africa. In the last sentence of that bullet point, this function is performed by issuing bank licenses to banking institutions and monitoring their activities. So banks here are very highly regulated by the South African Reserve Bank, uh, firstly. And in order to have a bank, guys, you need to have a license. Not anybody can just open up a bank and say, hey, man, I'm here and uh, begin to start operating. You must have a license. So the South African Reserve Bank obviously regulates that as well. Next, it does the national payment system. And the second sentence really highlights that very well. It says, the main aim is to reduce interbank settlement risk with the objective of reducing the potential of a systemic, of a systemic risk crisis emanating from settlement default by one or more of the settlement banks. So interbank settlement is when one bank owes the other money. When would this happen? So you decide that you're going to go to a store and that store, they have a POS machine, which is the machine that basically takes your bank account um, card and you use that there. So if you say, uh, for instance, banking with FNB, And that store has NetBank as their POS machine. It means whatever goods that I've bought on that FMB machine, FMB needs to transfer that money to NetBank. This is what they call interbank settlements. So at the end of the day, and this is happening all around the country, you'll find that let's say at the end of the day fnb will sit down and say how much do we owe netbank and netbank will then say how much do we owe fnb and this needs to be settled if this is not settled what can happen is that a bank could obviously then get into some financial trouble so we also want to make sure that that is not going to be the case so what the south african reserve bank does is that they monitor those things and make sure that that is not going to be the case it watches that like a hawk Second bit there says bank banker to other banks. And we talked about this via the repo rate. And I just want to read it as the book states, banker to other banks on page 295. It says the following. The bank acts as a custodian of the minimum cash reserves that bank are, banks are legally required to hold or referred to hold voluntary with the bank. By exerting control over the level and consumption, or sorry, composition of these reserves, the bank can to a certain extent affect the quantity of money. The reserves are also used to clear the bank's annual, sorry, mutual claims and obligations to one another. In this way, the Reserve Bank acts as a clearing bank. Obviously, the success of the clearing bank activities is very closely related to the smooth operations of the national payment system mentioned above. In terms of the last lender of resort activities, the bank may 
in certain circumstances provide liquidity to banks experiencing liquidity problems. And obviously, that would be then compensated for via the repo rate because they're not just going to uh, issue money just for the fun of it. It will have to be paid with interest. Next bit, bank notes and coins. Please highlight that as well. It says that the Reserve Bank has the sole right to make, issue, and destroy bank notes and coins. So you guys won the money on that earlier on in regards to that. Then it says that the SA Mint company is a subsidiary of the bank, mints all coins on behalf of the bank, while the South African Bank Note Company, another subsidiary of the bank, prints all bank notes on behalf of the bank. Man, oh man, wouldn't I want a connection at the SA Bank Note Company? If you guys know anyone, give me a shout. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Don't take me seriously, don't take me seriously. Right, um, moving on to 14.8. Let me know, guys, are there any questions in regards to the role of the South African Reserve Bank in the economy? Let me know in the chat if there is. If there isn't, I just need three thumbs up and then we'll jump on to the monetary policy. Chai says it's good. I'm glad. Everybody else, are you good as well? Kieran, Jesse. Okay, Ria, thank you. Awesome, Luke. Great, guys. So, got my three thumbs up, so I'm going to move right along. Awesome, Jesse. It says the monetary policy. Monetary policy may be defined as the measures taken by the monetary authorities to influence the quantity of money or the rate of interest with which a view to achieving stable prices, full employment, and economic growth. Right. So I'll just repeat that again. Um, the quantity of money or the rate of interest with a view to achieve stable prices, full employment, and economic growth. Stable prices in this case, guys, means we don't want to see fluctuations consistently. We prefer that things were not the case in that regard, but there's a stability in that regard. Eh? When it comes down to full employment, it's really sitting down and saying, guys, at the end of the day, what we do not want is to be in a space where we are not fully employing things. And fully employing things just means that we're using all of our resources to the fullest of the capability. Then economic growth, as stated before, we want to make sure with the monetary policy, we put ourselves or a country to a place where it's consistently growing economically. If not, it becomes a bit of a problem. Now, there's two forms of people that handle this monetary policy. There is what you call the South African Reserve Bank, which you guys already know of. I'm just going to write it out here. Monetary policy. And on one hand, we have the South African Reserve Bank that deal with this through the repo rate. On the other hand, we have the MPC, which is the Monetary Policy Committee. And these are government officials, and they've got their own tools as well. And we'll talk about the tool that they use in the next chapter. Um, but this has to deal with, in this case, Oh, actually, I won't give it away now. Let's leave it for them. The next bit that I want you to highlight under the monetary policy framework in South Africa would be the bullet points. It says there, the main features of the South African monetary policy framework at the time of writing can be summarized as follows. One, the ultimate objective is balanced and sustainable economic growth. We don't want to grow very fast because that obviously gives inflation. We want to grow steadily, right? 
Next bit, the intermediate objective is a pronounced inflation target, which is sitting down for a pre-announced, sitting down and saying our inflation target for this year will be X amount. And then we try our best to make sure that our monetary policy accommodates for that and the actions thereof as well. Third bit, the operation of variable and short-term interest rates, which are governed by changes in the repo rate. And then lastly, the monetary control system is a classical cash reserve system. Moving right along, the main elements of the classical cash reserve system are a minimal cash reserve requirement of 2.5% of the bank's total liabilities. What does that, that mean? Basically, if a bank has liabilities, right? Or maybe because we have covered this, let me know. What is a bank's liabilities? What is a bank's liabilities? Is it the money that they give out for loans or is it the demand deposits from consumers being bank accounts? What is a bank's liabilities? Let me know in the chat. It's Jess. Jess, you're on a, you're on a, you're on a roll. You're on a roll, bud. Mm hmm deposits, nice reader. Ooh, yes, they are, they are. So let's say a bank sits down and they've got demand deposits of, in this case, and this is a small bank, two million rand. When they speak about the minimum cash requirement of 2.5%, what they mean to say is 0.025 of this needs to be in cash. How much would that be, guys? If you could just do the maths for me where you are, 2 million times 0 0.025. What's the digit that you get on your side? And this is a very small bank. This is a very small bank. So they need to make sure that at any given time, they always have 50,000. Now, if they do not have 50,000, then this bank, depending on the demand deposits that are there, will obviously go bust. And what the South African Reserve Bank will try to do is make sure that they don't go bust by obviously giving them money. But in order to avoid all of this, they'll sit down with that bank and say, did you put this together? If not, this can be punishable. So basically, if you do the math here, you realize that these guys have 1 million, 900, sorry, 50,000, that they have to play with. And they'll take this money and basically loan it out at interest for the civilians and so forth. Now take note that not everybody's gonna take a loan, so some of this money obviously will remain, but this is basically what they do on a regular basis. So what the South African Reserve Bank does is they sit down and say, we cannot allow this to happen. We have to make sure that we are holding these guys accountable for at least making sure they've got that minimum, at least that minimum, because not everybody's going to get, uh, um, not everybody's going to get um, the 50,000 or not everybody's going to want to get that money today. I've got, um, yeah, there's some money that I've got and I haven't spent any of it uh, since I think last month. Um, so just goes to show. So somebody else is probably using that as a loan somewhere. Uh, Jesse, you say that's such a forgiving value. Could a super rich person bust a bank if they could request all their money at once? Hey, yes. Yes, that could be the case. I mean, if we all went together and we're, let's say we're all in one bank, right? And we decided we're all taking our money out. That bank will go bust. Some homework for probably for you guys to do is to look at a bank called Sambo. This is something that happened with them. There was a rumor that was going about that, uh, hey, 
these guys are going to go bust very quickly. And as a result of hearing that, everybody went in and said, we are taking our demand deposits and we're taking them elsewhere. Sambo was not in a position to pay out all of those demand deposits. As a result, they went bust. And this is why you've got to ask yourself the question, when you look at your bank account and you see those numbers, are those numbers real? Hmm. A question for you to just ponder on um, as we continue to highlight. Where was that? So it says there are various policy instruments. Um, this is the second point underneath the classical res cash reserve system. Various policy instruments aimed at creating a persistent liquidity shortage. The provision of cash reserves through the repo system, accommodation policy. The impact of the repo rate on short-term interest rates. The impact of a short-term interest rate on the credit creation, the stock, sorry, the money stock and other variables, and ultimately the rate of inflation. Next up, the instruments of monetary policy. It says there, as stated previously, a high priority is currently given to market-oriented policy instruments. The key instruments are, one, accommodation policy, with the repo rate as the policy variable, and then two, open market policy to render the interest policy effective. So let's talk about the accommodation policy, which really deals a lot with the repo rate. But in order to understand the repo rate, we need to look at box 14.9. And I'm just going to read the first paragraph and the first sentence, which I'll ask you to highlight in your book. It says, the repo rate may be defined as a sale of an existing security, financial asset, as agreed upon at an agreed upon price, coupled with an agreement by the seller to purchase, buy back the same security on a specific on a specified future date, normally seven days later, at the same price. The maturity value of the repo is determined in the initial agreement and consists of the price plus an agreed amount of interest. The interest represents the cost of obtaining the funds for the week, which comes back to your point, Jesse, earlier on. Last sentence, in terms of the present accommodation policy of the Reserve Bank, repos are the main means whereby banks can obtain funds in order to comply with their cash reserve requirements. So back to our example at hand, if my bank does not have 50,000 rand, And my demand deposits require 100,000 Rand. To make sure that my bank does not go broke, I'll go to the South African Reserve Bank and I'll say, hey guys, I need an extra 50,000 Rand. Could you please issue me with that? And what the South African Reserve Bank will do is say, great, we'll do that. We will give you 50,000 at a percentage of 6%. And in a week's time, we want the 50,000. Plus whatever interest would have accrued by then as well. Does that make sense, guys? This is what they're talking about around the repo agreement. And this is a seven-day instrument, a very powerful seven-day instrument. Let me know in the chat if you understand. Just give me a thumbs up. Awesome. And, uh, great to hear from you, Natalo, Jared, Luke, Jesse, and Vaughn. Great, guys. Awesome, Natasha. Awesome. Right. Let's read the accommodation policy. And it says the following. 
Um, this would be the second sentence on the top. It says 2.5% of their total liability to the public in the form of cash reserves with the Reserve Bank. Please highlight that. Then the next sentence I want you to highlight is on page 297, top right, second sentence from the top. And it says the following. Normally, one would expect banks that are in need of funds to make use of the overnight bank market where they borrow from other banks that have access funds in their disposal. These funds are obtained at the interbank overnight rate. However, if all banks have the same liquidity problems, the Reserve Bank as Bankers Bank acts as a lender or last resort, and the banks can then obtain funds by means of the repo system. All right, let's skip the sentence or rather the paragraph that has got repo tender system and go straight to the sentence in the next paragraph that reads as follows. The fixed rate determined by the bank represents the interest rate that banks have to pay for their, for their, for their required services. The accommodation policy of the Reserve Bank thus mainly comprises changes in the repo rate and other changes for other conditions on which cash is made available to banks. It is therefore the instrument by which the South African Reserve Bank can regulate the stock money through various variations in the cost of credit. And we talked about this. The higher the cost of credit, the less likely we're, about, we're going to go in and get credit. Changes in the repo rate lead to adjustments in the interest rates at which credit is made available to the banks, to their clients. And you guys already are, were on the money and guessing right in that regard. The cost of credit in the economy is therefore directly linked to the repo rate. Other interest rates, e.g. deposit rates and mortgage rates, also tend to move in sympathy with the repo rate. All right. Open market policy. Open market policy. Second paragraph, the sentence that has money, money market shortage. It says, the central bank uses open market transactions to ensure such persistent shortages of liquidity, also called the money market shortage. If it wishes to create or enlarge the bank's liquidity shortage, the central bank sells government bonds or other securities to banks, thereby reducing their cash reserves. In this way, the banks are compelled to make use of the central bank's financing facilities through repurchase agreements, thereby rendering the central bank's accommodation policy more effective. But does this mean? So, if the South African Reserve Bank sees that there's too much money in circulation, it will then issue out securities or government bonds. I'll just put here GV, government bonds or securities. To FNB, Discovery, Red Bank, ETC, ETC. And the money that these guys will then have in their reserves will basically go into buying that security. And therefore, the cash reserves for the South African Reserve Bank obviously increase. And the money in circulation that was there prior begins to decrease. Now, if it wants to do the opposite, it will then give these guys cash, decrease the amount of cash it has by buying back these treasury bills. And as a result, the money stock will increase. Are there any questions in that regard, guys? Let me know in the chat or are we all good to go? Just give me a thumbs up.
Where did I lose you, Monica? Let me know. Thank you, Jesse. Um, where you started mentioning the different banks and then I got lost. Okay, not a problem, Monica. Let me just repeat that. Glad to hear, Jared. So we have the South African Reserve Bank. And this South African Reserve Bank has uh, what we call treasury bills. And a treasury bill really at the end of the day, guys, is just, it's a type of bond that the government issues out, okay? Now with the treasury bill, what ends up happening is that if the South African Reserve Bank sees that there's too much money circulating in the economy, what they then decide is that they will sell these treasury bills to banks. And this could be FNB, it could be Discovery, it could be ABSA, sorry, or it could be Standard Bank. It could be either one of these banks. So it sells its treasury bill to them. And as a result of it selling its treasury bills, what the banks do is give them the, give them their, give the South African Reserve Bank their cash reserves. So back to our example, if this treasury bill is worth 50,000, it means that all of these banks, if the treasury bill has been issued to all of them, all of these banks now have minus 50,000 less. And if we do just these banks here, it means that essentially this economy has 200,000 rand less than it did before the treasury bill was issued. Does that make more sense, Monica? Awesome. I'm glad. Very welcome. Right. Um, still on page 298, guys, we've got other instruments. And it says there, these include non-market oriented measures such as credit ceilings and deposit rate control. We've got credit ceilings in bold and deposit rate control. And uh, these obviously have been discontinued. Changes in exchange control regulations, central bank intervention in foreign markets and public debt management. Please highlight that. These are other instruments that basically the, the bank uses. Then for 14.9, it says bank supervision. Uh, please highlight the following, basically everything apart from the last sentence. In addition to the cash reserves requirement of 2.5% of the bank's total liabilities, which forms part of the basis of the reserve bank's accommodation policy, Banking institutions must also adhere to various requirements in respect to their capital and liquid holdings. These requirements are more of a prudential nature and do not form part of the normal monetary policy arsenal of the Reserve Bank. So apart from the 2.5% that we're talking about, there might be other rules that say you should have X amount and so forth with your bank. Does everybody comply to it? I don't necessarily think so, um, but it is good sage advice in order to ensure that your bank has some sort of longevity. Um, you could ask Sambo all about that. In or on page 298, we've got concluding remarks. Um, right after the word transmission mechanisms, I'd want you to highlight the following. The transition mechanism describes how changes in the quantity of money and interest rates work their way through the economy, eventually to influence the price level, production, income, and other important variables. Please highlight that. Right, let's do some uh, some exercises. 
to see how far this information has sunk. Monetary sector. Now, for those of you who can, uh, please zoom in. Zoom in on the page uh, just to see where we're at and so forth. All right, let's, uh, let's begin with the first question. It says, if products prices in South Africa were stated in terms of sugar beans instead of rands and cents, then sugar beans would be functioning primarily as A, store value, B, a unit of exchange, A, medium of exchange, or D, fiduciary money. What would it be? A, B, C, or D? Put your answer into the chat. Interesting. Why didn't you guys stay, say store value? Let me know. And uh, yes, Jesse, you can post in the group. Why didn't you guys say store value? Let me know. Why medium of exchange? No, not store value. I mean unit of account. Love it. Okay, definitely give yourselves a, a point there. We've got uh, one point. We've got about 20 marks here. So I'm getting, okay, good, good, good. Getting that 10 um, questions around this. So we've got our first 20, sorry, our first two. Medium of exchange, boom. All right, next one. Short and medium term deposits are included in, ooh, nice. A, B, C, or D. I always go with the uh, okay, okay, okay. Let's wait for probably one more. Um, a, B, C, or D. Right, I'm just going to go with B. So, guys, uh, we'll do the first four, and we'll take it from there. Banks can create money by A, B, C, or D. We just need four answers, and we'll move on to the next one. Right now, we've got four out of 20. 
Can we get to six? Banks can create money by A, printing additional bank notes, B, paying interest to the depositors, C, offering financial services such as money market accounts, or D, making loans that result in additional deposits. Oh, C's way. Says D. Ria D. Luke says D. Can we get one more? A, B, C, or D. <laughs> I like the way he's laughing. Um, all right, guys. In this case, it is D. In this case, it is D. Um, these other ones have nothing to do with anything. But uh, thanks for the effort, Jesse. I feel like you're, you're laughing there because you probably knew what the answer was. Um, but yeah. Right, so now guys, we're on six, um, and that's uh, obviously inside the textbook, which you can obviously have a look at as well. We're on six, we, let's get to eight. The demand for money is, ooh, I like this one. A, the amount of various participants in the economy plan to hold in the form of money balances. B, the interest that it is earned when the money is used to purchase bonds. A, the amount of money that various participants in the economy want to hold in the form of money balances. And D, the money balances that are held at various participants by various participants of the economy. Let's go, let's go. Could it be A, B, C, or D? Got an A? Got an A as well? Why A and not D? Let me know, Rhea, Kieran, Vaughn, and Natasha. Why A and not D? Grace? Why A, guys, and not D? Let me know. <laughs> Love it, guys. Um, you guys are making me smile from where I am. The answer there is A, guys. It is A. It's about planning to all. Once you hear demand, it's about plans. Love it. Well, guys, that means that we're at 8 out of 10. Sorry, 8 out of 20. All right, so 40%. Um, let's, 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 get it to, let's get it to 10. The liquidity preference theory holds that demand for passive balances, I feel like this is a very important one, is determined by ooh, which motive? Luke says C. 
could it be? Oh, Jesse says C as well. Hmm. What say the rest of you? <laughs> How bad, Jesse? Uh, uh, fair reasoning, Jesse. Fair reasoning. Aria says three. We just need one more, guys. One more. A, B, C, or D when it comes to passive balances. Absolutely, guys. The answer to that is speculative. Now, if this had been active balances, then the answer to that would have been A. But the answer here, guys, is definitely C. Guys, we're on 50%, and apparently when we do 50%, uh, it means that we've just passed. All right, so let's, uh, let's, let's aim to get that uh, 20. Let's aim to get that 20. It says, in order to reduce the inflation rate, the South African Reserve Bank could. Hmm, something tells me that this is the important thing here. Reducing the inflation rate. Hearing a lot of this, C. Yep, very tricky one, Jesse. Very tricky one. Very tricky one. Very, very tricky one. I'll just wait for one more answer and then I will uh, give the answer to this one. B or D? <laughs> pick one, C's there. Pick one. Pick one. Um, right. Shall I give the answer? Okay, you'll go with D. All right, let's walk through this. Number one, when it comes down to the South African Reserve Bank, right? Um, what tool does it use in order to Re reduce what tool does it use rather what's the name of the tool interest rates right um, so it uses the repo rate in this case which deals with interest right the other thing that it does as we talked about just now was treasure bills which is a form of bonds that it also does so if we look at the first one, when it comes to increased taxes, we know for a fact that it's not A. Because A is a monetary policy, another type of monetary policy that we'll deal with that the government does, right? We've got B, and B, they talk about, obviously, um, bonds. So we're looking at treasury bills and going, maybe that could be the case. Let's look at C, though. C says decrease government spending. And this has got nothing to do with 
the South African Reserve Bank, because the South African Reserve Bank is autonomous from the government. So it can't tell the government what to do. So your tax rates and your government spending, this is actually a monetary, not monetary, this is what the Monetary Policy Committee does. Those are the policies that it puts together. Tax and the government spending. Then we talk about lowering reserve requirements. Now these two are interesting, which is why um, I was teasing Seasway over there, right? When it comes down to lowering the reserve requirements, let's just entertain this thought. The lower the reserve requirements for banks, do you think that frees up money or do you think that decreases money? If I were to lower the reserve requirements, because the reserve requirement means that there's money that the government that the bank is meant to have um because of its demand deposits but if i lower it it means that basically there's what is there more money or less money in the economy because of that let me know in the chat there's more right and therefore we know for a fact if we're trying to reduce the rate of inflation it means there's too much money there so it can't be lowering the requirements and therefore we sell bonds but why is it grant that selling bonds allows for this to happen well it's very simple you see when i sell a bond it means i give you an issue you a paper and you in turn give me money so i begin to decrease the money that's in the economy and therefore it is b so right now guys we are still on 10 out of 20. So yes, it is B. So Caesar, you're on the money. Just needed you to make a decision. Let's get some easy points. Let's get that 80% at least, guys. Uh, the present governor for the of the South African Reserve Bank is. <laughs> you guys aren't even playing. So give us our marks. Give us our marks. Um, so that's 12 out of 20. I'm not even going to waste your time. You guys are right. In terms of the demand for money, the interest rate represents ha, 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 the rate at which money can be converted into the demand deposits, the opportunity cost of holding money, the return on money that is saved for the future, the rate at which the current consumption can be exchanged for future consumption, A, B, C, or D. Jesse says C or D. Kamo says uh, C. <laughs> when in doubt. Okay. Uh, I'll just do this uh, to ease the pain. Page 287 in uh, the new textbook. Read that and then let me know whether you'd still pick C. Does everybody else agree? Andrea, let, let me know whether you saw that first um, in the textbook when I gave the answer or whether you uh, you got that beforehand. Let me just know in the chat. It could be the saving grace uh, for us. We either get two or not. <laughs> of course, he's way, of course. And they're meant to. They're absolutely meant to. Okay, 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 okay. We see you, Ria. We see you. All right, guys, at least one of us got it, so it is B. It is B in this case. 
demand deposit, the interest rate represents. The rate at which money can be converted into demand deposit, nope, that has nothing to do with the interest rate. Um, the return on money that is saved for the future, uh, no, that has nothing as well to do with that. The rate at which current consumption can be exchanged for future consumption, nope, that has nothing to do with anything as well. It's always going to be B, the opportunity cost for holding money. The interest rate represents the opportunity cost. The higher the interest rate, the more the opportunity cost for holding that money for speculative reasons. The lower the interest rate, the less the opportunity cost for holding that money for speculative reasons. Right? Uh, Kia, Ria, I mean to say, we will give you that. <laughs> we'll give you that. Uh, you have saved the group. We've got two extra points. Guys, let's just finish this and then we're out. We're out. The repo rate is. Come on, guys. Let's get in there and let's get these two marks. Sure. You, you all aren't even playing now. Okay. 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 All right, guys. I get it. I get it. I get it. Yes, it is C. It is C. Um, and then the last one. Which of the following statements is not an instrument of the monetary policy. Ooh. Ooh, this is nice. This is nice. A, B, C, or D. Let's just wait for two more. Just uh, verifying. Awesome, guys. That's uh, 18 out of 20. So you only got uh, one wrong at the end of the day. Well done, guys. Guys, this has been brilliant. Uh, the next time we meet, we will then go through chapter 15. I have completed your ice task. I'm just uh, yes to upload it, but we're done and dusted. So you will see it for the first unit, and then I'll try to get the second unit done um, during the weekend. But yeah, awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, likewise, Jesse, enjoy the weekend, guys. Have fun. Always welcome, Kieran. Always welcome. Very welcome, Jared. Uh, very welcome, Seasway. <laughs>